So as some of you might know, we have for a while had a membership program here at TFD, our society at TFD. So if you join our famous society at TFD, there are two different tiers and here's what you get for each of them. Our $2.99 a month supporter tier includes 40% off of all of the studio at TFD events, that's conferences, workshops, classes, master classes, everything in between, monthly 45 minute office hours with Chelsea, that's me, where you get to join live, hang out, ask me anything, they're always super fun. Access to exclusive monthly downloads like wallpapers and staff picks, plus the fun moan emojis that you can use in the comments. But our $4.99 membership tier, and this is very important, gets you the following. 50% off of all Studio at TFD events, that same 45 minute office hours with me once a month, access to all of those monthly downloads, plus an exclusive quarterly download bundle for longer form stuff like workbooks and tools to manage your finances, one bonus video per month, plus you'll get a dedicated Slack channel with like-minded community members to talk about all things money and personal finance, and of course, don't forget those moan emojis. Anyway guys, that's my spiel. Please join the society, maybe even tell a friend to. It would mean so much. Hello everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, Chelsea Fagan, your host, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet, and woman who loves to talk about money. And as anyone who is familiar with this channel and show know, when it comes to talking about money, uh, as a woman raised in, let's just say an unoptimal culture, often what many of us are talking about when it comes to our consumer choices is how we present ourselves. There's beauty, there's fashion, there's makeup, there's hair, there is the cult of skincare, there's weight loss and body optimization, and basically an endless litany of ways to spend and shame yourself into being the person that so much of our culture wants us to be. Now on the flip side, there is also a very pervasive narrative, especially around a very specific type of feminism that I think is sort of waning in terms of its popularity, but it's still pretty present and pretty noxiously coupled with capitalism that teaches us that essentially anything we do is empowering, uh, even the things that we may find ultimately are rather destructive for ourselves or for other women in the longer term. Now, I want to be clear that beauty standards and the oppressive consumerism that they often entail are not limited to women. I've talked, for example, on this channel before about how men's body standards, especially in the era of superhero movies, and the endless quest for the perfect body can also be extremely damaging. But at the end of the day, I am a woman and so is the vast majority of my audience. So it's always worth discussing these things from this particular perspective first and foremost. Now, I should also say that we've had a fair amount of guests on this show before who speak about these issues, beauty standards, treatments, procedures, and everything else under that umbrella from a pretty wide range of perspectives. For example, we recently had on the channel YouTuber Lori Hill, who is both quite critical of the mystery around celebrity beautification and cosmetic industrial complexes, but who is also herself rather transparent about the numerous cosmetic enhancements that she herself has undergone. My guest today is someone who writes and edits on this entire topic, beauty and the broader social context in which we perceive it, from what I consider to be an extremely interesting perspective. It's not the polar opposite of what we discussed on the show with Lori, but I do think it is a pretty interesting antidote to that particular point of view. My guest today is Jessica Defino. She's a writer, an editor, and someone who, as I mentioned, has an incredibly interesting view on the beauty world that we live in. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so just to get it right out of the way, Obviously, you're a beauty writer and editor, yes. but for those who are not familiar, you are fairly critical of the beauty industrial complex and opt out of quite a lot of it yourself. So can you start by explaining your particular perspective on beauty? Yeah, so I tend to think of myself as a beauty culture critic. So I'm taking a really critical lens um, and looking at beauty culture and the beauty industry and the ways that we participate and how that sort of affects the collective and how that sort of feeds into some of these very damaging messages that we get and procedures we undergo in order to adhere to standards. Um, and I think a pretty succinct way of summing up my general view is I, I say that I'm pro people and anti product. Mm. So a ton of beauty industry coverage tends to center on products, procedures, all of these sorts of aesthetic interventions. My coverage focuses on people, mm. how it affects us 
um, psychologically, how it affects us physically, and looking sort of at the full person and how that person or collective of people is affected by beauty products rather than like, wow, this skincare product can change the way you look. Now, to just get a little little timeliness going here because we are all, you know, servant to that algorithm. Um, I read an article of yours today on your newsletter, The Unpublishable, um, which was about uh, Madonna's cosmetic procedures. Um, for those watching on YouTube, we'll put some pictures up here. Um, but for those listening, feel free to pause and Google. Um, but your article I thought was very interesting because Madonna is someone who has undergone um, a level of cosmetic intervention that I think most people would identify as not achieving or possibly even aiming for conventionally beautiful or attractive. Mm -hmm. But your position on the issue was that it is still, I don't want to use the word problematic because I don't think that's the way you frame it, but mm -hmm. is still kind of subject to um, an, a sort of socio-cultural uh, framework that is not inherently disempowering, but is really worth interrogating. And the people framing Madonna's choice to kind of style herself this way as a rejection of societal norms don't quite have it right. Could you talk a little bit about that article and sort of what it means more broadly about our ideals of beauty? Yeah, I mean, I think to frame what she has done to herself through the use of beauty tools as a rejection of beauty standards is just very misguided and backwards and just a little bit too convenient. Like it really gives us an excuse to continue participating in these systems, mm. to financially prop up an industry that's, you know, really damaging by saying, I'm actually rejecting it. And like, that's just too convenient and doesn't actually, um, it doesn't actually reflect how these industries are affecting us and what like extreme beauty standards such as what Madonna looks like now um, become eventually. I think a really great example of this is to think of like Kylie Jenner and mm. when she first started filling her lips like she was mocked quite a bit in the beginning. People were like this is ridiculous the over full lips and then it became more normalized and it sort of kicked off this injectable boom and this trend of, you know, overlining your lips and filling your lips. And it seemed ridiculous at first, but now it's very mainstream. Um, and this is how beauty standards work. So someone in the public eye, typically a celebrity, models an extreme sort of behavior to us. And eventually the general public sort of adopts that and all of the problems that come with it. And so that's kind of the lens that I was critiquing um, Madonna's look through. And I think like basically any argument that you could make that what she's doing is somehow empowering or a rejection of the system of beauty standards is kind of um, invalidated by the fact that she has a celebrity beauty brand that sells mm. anti-aging products. Like she's directly profiting off of these standards that she's saying she's subverting. And then, you know, she says she subverts the standard and then is selling a mask to reduce your fine lines and wrinkles to people. So it just, it doesn't add up. You can't, you can't have both. You can't have your, you know, cosmetic surgery and eat it too, or whatever that phrase is. Well, you also pointed out uh, there was a comparison photo that some woman posted mm -hmm. of Madonna and her mother, which I must uh, shamelessly self-promote and say that I did comment on that as well to sort of run down uh, a speculation on the procedures that that woman's mother had yes. probably had. I uh -huh. think anyone with a little familiarity can look at it and spot about 10 things, um, which I, for the record, have zero judgment about. And I think she looks great and I'd love to look like that. But um, you did make a good point that there is this very arbitrary distinction that we make between what is acceptable and what isn't. And often what it really boils down to is just a question of finesse, but they're doing the same things. Exactly. Like I think in that tweet, there was a side by side of Madonna who had clearly had very obvious cosmetic surgery and, you know, some other older lady her age who, you know, looked, you know, as if she had aged gracefully. And that was the tweet. It was like aging gracefully is more beautiful. 
when I looked at those side by side pictures, like I just saw two women who had put a significant amount of aesthetic labor into cultivating a very specific look. And I think if we focus on the surface level look of the aesthetic instead of the labor that goes into creating both of those like very different looks we're focusing on the wrong thing like both women invested a significant amount of time money effort and brain space to create this aesthetic of what they want to look like as they age um and in both cases like it um I'm trying to think of like the best way to phrase it because I'm I read the article because I'm more eloquent in my writing than it's a great article I highly recommend it but um I think we have to look at what we are investing in our appearance rather than what the outcome is like we have to focus on the input rather than the outcome well I mean for I mean I, I for those not watching for those just listening you know just sitting in front of me you know you're quite well styled. I think you have a nice little look going. Um, and you know, it seems as though you've invested some time into your appearance and into your look, um, which I think is great. But I also think a lot of people might wonder, you know, where do you put the limits on that and what is healthy versus unhealthy in that way? Well, so I have a few responses. One is that my work is as a journalist. So a lot of what I write about is not about me. I'm not right. putting myself in the story. I'm just trying to objectively report on what's happening with beauty culture. And so I try to like take myself out of it as much as possible. The other thing is, is that, you know, I have been obsessed with beauty for my entire life. Like from a very young age, I was conditioned to believe that beautiful is the most important thing I could be. And it was the source of my worth and my value. You know, I was in beauty pageants when I was younger. I was a performer. I went to like Berklee College of Music for performance and I wanted to be a singer songwriter. And then after college, I worked for the Kardashian Jenner official apps and I was very much in that world. And that was reflected on my face. You know, like I've never done surgeries or injectables or anything like that, but I was obsessed with skincare and with makeup. I wouldn't even like leave the house to go buy toilet paper at CVS without a full face of foundation and cat eyeliner and red lipstick. And I would like paint on a mole on my face like Marilyn Monroe, like it was intense. And so this process of deconditioning for me has been a process. And I look at what I use now and it is so much less Mm. than what I was using. And hopefully in, you know, two more years, it will be even less than what I'm currently using now. And I don't think it's necessarily healthy to tell people like stop participating in beauty culture completely because um, beauty culture is a coping mechanism. Like we use these things as coping mechanisms to deal with a culture that doesn't value us unless we participate in the right ways. And so to take all of that away immediately without coming up with some better coping mechanisms, perhaps like internal coping mechanisms or self-care things, um, isn't necessarily, I think, the healthiest thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm like deep into this process. And I personally draw the line at anything skincare wise that is like manipulating the appearance rather than enhancing health and function of the skin. Mm. Um, so that means I like, pretty much use no skincare. The skin is like pretty self-sufficient. Um, I won't do like injectables. I won't do surgeries. I won't do anything like that personally. Um, and then in terms of makeup, I wish I didn't wear any, but I do sometimes, especially for like professional things. Mm-hmm. I still feel like, like I have a lot of acne scarring and I'm working on disentangling this idea that if I don't look polished with like a little bit of no makeup makeup that I'm not professional so that's something I'm working through now let me be clear audience we will be getting into the Kardashian of it all that is on the agenda uh as well as the skincare of it all because I'm blown away by your like sort of lack of skincare routine I've read a lot about it and this poor audience has been held hostage to ample conversation about my dermatological journey. So <laughs> I'm very interested. We've also spoken with, for example, a cosmetic dermatologist cool. and a lot of other people who function probably not at the polar opposite of what you're describing, but quite opposite. So I want to get into those things. But, you know, what's interesting to me is when you're describing what is optimal for you or what you're sort of aspiring toward, you mentioned that you hope that any beauty interventions that you will be taking on, you know, even something as simple as a lip stain or, you know, hairstyling or what have you, um, 
that those things will continue to ebb as the years go and that you would, in an ideal scenario, never wear makeup or or generally not wear it. Um, I'm curious, A, kind of where that comes from for you in terms of that being the optimal outcome, but also B, if that extends to other aspects of presentation, like for example, the clothes that we wear, or the jewelry yeah. or things like that. I'm really glad you asked. I think I love fashion. I love self-expression. I love makeup as self-expression. I think it's a very convenient excuse most of the time to conflate aesthetic, like beauty interventions with self-expression. Um, something I like to say is like, if this were really all self-expression, would all of our like dynamic, unique selves be like expressing via foundation and a cat eye? Like, no, like the, the standard of beauty that we have is far too limited it for it to like actually be authentic self-expression. Like it can be, that's what beauty was in, you know, the beginning of time makeup was used as like a tool of community. Like you would wear different types of makeup to signal your your place in the community like a tribal elder would have something and somebody you know going through puberty would have something else and you know the religious leader the shaman would have a different form of makeup and that was a communal expressive thing you would wear it in like religious ceremonies to sort of reflect back um you know the traits that you ascribe to your gods that sort of thing um and so i do think that there is of course, room for beauty to be self-expression. But for the most part today, it's more often used as a tool of conformity, control, consumerism, complacency. And so for me, it's really important to examine that. And that feels like, um, you know, not to be cheesy, but like part of like my personal like purpose and soul journey is to sort of like scrub myself of all of the artifice and like figure out like who am I really without all of this stuff? And I don't know, that feels like important to me. That's why I care about like lessening my reliance on external markers of totally. expression. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that I would say is that I see fashion and beauty as being completely different. I mm. see like art and beauty as being completely different. And like when I say beauty, I'm referring to standardized beauty, industrialized beauty, commercialized beauty, the kind of beauty that we're we're buying and applying not beauty in like the spiritual energetic sense, you know, not the way like nature is beautiful or, you know, love is beautiful. Um, The really dangerous thing about our beauty standards today, like as applied to our bodies and our faces is the way that they affect us psychologically. Mm -hmm. Um, Our skin is inherently connected to um, our brains via like nerve pathways there's a really fascinating field of study called psychodermatology that examines that um you can kind of see it too in like emotional responses like so for instance like when you get angry and your skin gets really red that's the brain skin connection you know when you're scared and like your color drains that's the brain skin connection um getting goosebumps when you like meet someone that you're super attracted to that's the brain skin connection um and the skin is actually like the only way that our brain can perceive that we are physical beings in the world you know this is all that we see to know like i'm real and i'm here and i'm not just like a floating orb of consciousness Mm. um and so it really does affect our sense of identity and our sense of self and our sense of like who we are and where we are in the world and who we can connect to Mm -hmm. um and there are really positive outcomes of that um or positive ways to express that like i think of tattoos tattoos are a way that humans have used for you know centuries to convey meaning to take this sort of like intangible concept that we have of of what's important to us or who we are and make it physical like make it known um and i think that's beautiful and i think that's a lot of what we are trying to do with commercialized beauty with standardized beauty but we're doing it in ultimately really unhealthy ways that aren't advancing our like sense of self or our identity aren't like helping us Mm -hmm. they're actually hurting us in a lot of ways and I think if we don't like take a step back and understand that everything that we do to our skin and our body like is sort of affecting our sense of identity and our sense of self for better or for worse Mm -hmm. um, then we're just kind of going about this in a really misguided way fashion for instance is very different because you're taking it on and off it's not becoming like a permanent part of you Um, like something like injectables and surgery, like that's altering you, you know, 
temporarily or permanently, you know, skincare alters what's actually happening on your skin, the chemistry of your skin, um, makeup you can wash on and off, but sometimes like we don't present that to the world. I mean, at least for me and a lot of people I've talked to, like I wouldn't interact with the world without makeup on for a very significant portion of my life. Like I didn't feel safe to show up that way. And so to me, that's where it's different than something like fashion where it's expressive and you're removing it and you're trying something new and it's temporary it's not affecting um even like psychologically and scientifically your sense of identity in the same way Hmm. yeah i mean i think when it comes i mean it's it's like all consumer choices right i think like there are a lot of people who would have perhaps as toxic a relationship to fashion as you had with beauty. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, we talk quite a lot on the channel about the fast fashion industry and how we've also had a lot of people um, on the channel who have had to completely overhaul their relationship with clothing um, and accessories and things like that. Because I think conversely to the sort of skincare beauty, by the way, called out, foundation cat eye, uh, <laughs> fully fully getting a facelift when I'm in my 50s. I like could not be more opposite, but it's not something I struggle with. Uh-huh. It doesn't, I all I can say is that while I definitely agree with your assertion that it would be really disingenuous to say that this is entirely for oneself, mm-hmm. um, for the record, I think it's almost completely disingenuous to say that about almost literally any choice that we make as human beings. Um, I do think that, you know, it's important to have uh, at least a lucid understanding of why we're doing things and what it makes us feel and the reasons and so forth. However, I do think a lot of people have that same relationship with clothing and accessories where unlike, you know, makeup and skincare can have class connotations for sure. I would say skincare in particular and Trust me, we've gone down this road and we'll go down it again. But clothing and accessories for so many people are such strong markers of class that I mm-hmm. think a lot of people feel a similarly a similar need to completely overhaul and start from zero. And I do think regardless of what your particular, I don't want to say vice, it's not a vice, but your particular struggle might be uh, with you know the interplay between your own choices in society, it's probably always worth it to to try and do some sort of a a reset as you have done. Um, Now we have to get to it. You worked for the Kardashians. Yes. Well, I worked technically for a third party company that produced the Kardashian content. (laughs) Oh my God. The licensing and like third party (laughs) vacation of the Kardashian empire is unreal. So quickly to just kind of go through it, were you like drawn to work for them? Were you like a Kardashian girly? I wasn't a Kardashian girly. I was like a celebrity girly. At the time, I was working for this editorial agency in LA and we produced celebrity content for international magazines. So I was producing like Rihanna for Harper's Bazaar Arabia and Salma Hayek for El Mexico. And I mean, it was really fun. It was really cool. I was very like in the celebrity world and that's where I wanted to be. And I was kind of you know, I was in LA. I was I was doing the thing. I was living the dream. And then I think I got recruited on LinkedIn for the Kardashian apps. And you were excited when that I happened. I was so excited. Wow. What year are we talking? 2015. Okay. So like, ooh. That was like peak, by the way, peak like the Kardashians are feminist. The Kardashians yes. are good for women. And that was my thinking. I was like, look at these powerful women with no talent running an empire anyway and just making it work. And look at what they've built out of absolutely nothing. And it felt very exciting to like align with the most famous women in the world. I assume there must have been a very quick falling of the scales from the eyes. Can you talk a little bit about what happened? Yeah. I mean, I was very excited to be there. I loved creating the content and felt felt very like creatively fulfilling for sure. I had a great time um, writing and coming up with ideas and brainstorming and like making this into a reality. Um, I think there were a couple of different things that happened like concurrently Mm. that sort of shattered my like worldview and self-view. But one of them was just like the pay. The pay was so low and so bad and the hours were constant. It was 24-7. We were always on call um, in the office late, like eating all meals at the office together as a crew, not really getting a ton of breaks and just 
I mean, it was it was all encompassing. The job was my entire life. And there were times when I didn't have enough money in my bank account to like put gas in my car and drive an hour into the office. Jesus. Like I would call out sick because that's how little money I was making for LA. Um, so that was very, you know, disillusioning, I guess. Yeah. So that so- st- sort of got me questioning the system. And like you, you hear like you just have to work – really hard for no money for x amount of time and eventually it will pay off and i just started questioning like whether it would pay off like could i come back from this from just like having nothing and dedicating all of my time to these women and building their empire so that was one thing and then i mean i just got a behind the scenes look at like the creation of a beauty standard and like the exploitation of an audience that was really unsettling so like for instance on kylie's app you know, a lot of the content was like lip kit content and people were buying these, you know, Kylie Cosmetics lip kits like crazy, but like her lips were the product of fillers. And I remember on Chloe's app, we did a story of like how to fake a nose job with contour, but she had an actual nose job. So she's got to have had like five by now. She's only admitted to one, I think. But like, yeah, so I just started seeing like all of these things that didn't match up or like Kim's app was like how to look photoshopped without you know just with makeup it was like we had a photoshop artist who photoshopped you like (laughs) the pictures you're using are photoshopped so it it just I started to like identify more with like the audience I think and seeing how they were being duped and then I was like whoa I've been duped this whole time my life has been a lie and yeah down the rabbit hole I went that is okay. So we like probably the most popular video we did on the subject was like f- the how celebrities financially gaslight you about beauty, mm-hmm. and like it is truly unbelievable the lying that happens. And I really do feel like although the Kardashians certainly didn't start that, I do feel like they've kicked it into such a like hyper normalization mm-hmm. of like we're supposed to look at this and think any of this is natural or normal or real or like and I do wonder how you know I look back at like when our company was starting and we when we sold our first book like every single meeting that we went to was like this should be the girl boss for money like there was such a a vivid Mm -hmm. era at that Mm -hmm. time of really framing women in a way and women's choices quote unquote and you know as you said like what is you know financially abusive and the exploitation and the lying that there was a real period in which that was not just socially acceptable, but really, really valorized. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, from your perspective, especially as someone who worked for that company, like, do you feel that we really are coming out of that? Or do, or are we still sort of in that ether of anything a woman does is empowering? Yeah, I don't necessarily think we're coming out of it. I think we're finding, like, creative new ways to say the same old thing. Um, I mean, I think for me, the thing that comes up is like this idea in, in beauty culture right now that like Botox is self-care and cosmetic surgery is self-care. Like we're finding new ways to use the like girl boss ethos of like whatever is good for you or whatever like gets you the most attention in the attention economy or whatever like brings you higher up on this like beauty hierarchy is is necessarily like good and empowering and like a net positive so we're just finding like more wellnessy ways of saying the same thing maybe um but i don't think we're necessarily uh any closer towards liberation from some of these ideas you know do you really i mean it sounds like you do but do you draw a really straight line between having worked for the kardashians and kind of seen that up close and your own personal mission to to really opt out of this stuff yeah I do think it's a big part of it um I also think you know it can get a little sticky when we're talking about specific pop culture figures like the Kardashians or like Madonna where part of what I want to do yes is like highlight all the gaslighting that goes into it highlight that all of this is a lie but also highlight where we are complicit because like the Kardashians can't make an aesthetic change and like 
completely transform the face of beauty culture without our participation. Like, Mm -hmm. this is where I want to, like, turn around and point the finger at the beauty media. Mm -hmm. Like, the Kardashians do something, and immediately there are 100 articles within five minutes of how to do the same thing or how to get the look for yourself. That's not really them. Like, they're exploiting the system. They are, you know, pulling the levers. They are doing what they can. But there is so much more happening that is allowing certain people to rise to the level of like influence on beauty standards and beauty culture besides them so like yes I'm looking at them but I'm also looking at like what was my participation how a, a member of the beauty media did I outsource these or like you know put out these standards and these ideas to other people and how have I as a consumer over the years by participating in some of this stuff um, spread these standards towards people within my circle and made them even more popular and like yeah I think for my work of course I want to look at these like very powerful figures um, but I also want to look at the media and their complicity and the general public and our complicity and where opting out as individuals actually does have like resounding cultural consequences that can can benefit us yeah i mean the the beauty media is yeah they they created a monster and now they (laughs) must live with it um Mm -hmm. now on that note you mentioned that you don't have a skincare routine yes now i would love to know what i mean i know what that means as someone who's (laughs) read your work but i would love to talk about what that actually means in practice and what what led you to that yeah okay well i'll start with what led me to it um which was just dermal disaster um so i've like I said, I've always been like very obsessed with skincare. I used all the products. I've also always had like quote unquote problem skin. So I've been going to a dermatologist since I was like 12 and I've been on every product or prescription you could possibly imagine from antibiotics to rounds of Accutane to, you know, retinoids, um, all sorts of like prescription gels, creams, cleansers, um, all of the like drugstore favorite brands from growing up, you know, like the orange Neutrogena face wash and the clean and clear and um, unfortunately the St. Ives Af- apricot scrub. I mean, <laughs> all of it. full of knives. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but basically what happened to me was when I started working at the Kardashian-Jenner apps, it was the first time in my life that I had been um, on the gifting side of, of beauty PR. So I was getting tons of free products and using a ton of free products. And it was also in a really high stress job, you know, really high stress environment. So I think the combination of physical stress and psychological stress, my skin started freaking out. I developed something called dermatitis. I went to the dermatologist. The standard treatment for dermatitis is steroids, topical steroids. And I was like, great, let's do it. I have used everything a dermatologist has ever told me to use, and I will use this too. Uh, I was on topical steroids for two years, (gasps) and that's way too long. (laughs) It caused something called skin atrophy, where basically my skin stopped responding to the steroids um, and also stopped functioning because it had been so dependent on the steroids and like drug dependency because steroids are a drug. So I had to stop using the steroids because my skin couldn't take it. I went into topical steroid withdrawal. And yeah, basically my skin just like stopped. It's really bad. It stopped functioning, was peeling off of my face like my face was oozing, it was red, it was like leaking plasma. I couldn't wear makeup, Um, I couldn't use skincare, even like splashing my face with water um, burned. And I was just in this place where I had been so let down by everything that I had ever used. And I couldn't understand it because it went against everything I had ever learned. You know, I'd been obsessed with skincare for my whole life and I could tell you anything about any product. Um, What I realized when I had this sort of like crisis of the skin slash crisis of the self was like I actually had no idea like why my skin was behaving the way it was behaving because I knew nothing about the skin. Like we know so much about products. We know so little about the skin. Mm. And so I started just like with research, like PubMed being like, okay, how does the skin barrier work? Like why would this drug cause this reaction? Like how does dependency develop? And basically went down this research rabbit hole that showed me the skin is almost completely self-sufficient. It self-cleanses, self-moisturizes, self-exfoliates, self-heals, self-protects. Makes sense when you think that, you know, human skin has survived and thrived for millennia before um, (laughs) pre-bottled products came on the scene. Um, So we really don't need much. 
And in fact, the research shows that the more we put on our skin in terms of external topical products, um, the more we disrupt the skin barrier and um, disrupt the skin microbiome, which are basically the two things you need to have intact in order to have skin that functions on its own. Um, So I stopped using everything. I stopped using products completely. And within like two weeks, I had seen more healing than I had ever seen in my entire life from when I started, you know, going to the dermatologist at 12. And it was fascinating to me, but also was just like, duh, because I had all of this research to back it up. So I and I finally understood like what was happening and how my skin was healing and how it was learning to take care of itself. And so today my skincare routine is just like, let it do its thing. And because my skin has been compromised by a lot of the things I've done to it in the past, it does need some topical support in order to function um, in the way that it's supposed to. So for the most part, my routine is jojoba oil. Jojoba oil is a 97% match to human sebum. So the skin really responds well to it. So I have like pretty dry skin. I'll use a little jojoba oil as a moisturizer applied to damp skin to sort of lock in a little bit extra hydration. And that's like the extent of my routine. If I'm going outside, I'll use an SPF. Um, And if I need to like wash makeup or SPF off of my face at night, I will do an oil cleanse with jojoba and then cleanse after that with pure manuka honey. And that's it. Wow. Yeah. Would you say, I mean, does that put you in the position of feeling like outside of like, I guess, like cancers and stuff that dermatology is a scam? Yes. Yeah. I think um, dermatologists are very important for things like your annual skin cancer screening, things that are health issues. What happens with dermatology is what we've seen in a lot of other fields of health. Um, For example, I think this is a really great place to illustrate the um, similarities between diet culture and skincare culture. So for instance, for a really long time, and I mean, even still today, beauty standards of being thin as being seen as healthy have been sort of the norm in in the medical field and doctors will put patients on all sorts of unhealthy diets in order to get them to be thin Um, and will do really intense surgeries like bariatric surgeries that aren't necessarily about health but about thinness or using the BMI as a marker of health for so long when now we have tons of research that shows BMI is really not a great indicator of health and it's based on this really like racist system of fat phobia that even developed some of that in the same way a lot of beauty standards have been subsumed into dermatology a lot of what dermatology is is helping patients conform to aesthetic standards um, that really have nothing to do with the health and functioning of the skin and this is not like a dig against dermatologists it's a dig against the like patriarchal white supremacist colonialist capitalist system that gave rise to the american healthcare system Listen, we <laughs> we feature dermatologists on this show. We feature people critical of them. I think, yeah. I mean, I, I go to the dermatologist every year, and I have them check my moles, and I say, um, pardon my language, but like, F- you for offering me Botox at this healthcare appointment. But oh. like, <laughs> no, you know? I I think it's it's totally they offer it to you unsolicited. It's on like the paperwork. At the last time that I went to the dermatologist, it was like on the intake form was. Um, a Botox offer. And I I get that feedback a lot. Like I've researched this a lot. Um, I've interviewed a ton of people and this is like kind of the norm now at dermatologist offices. You are offered or given like introductory materials about aesthetic interventions when you're there for like a healthcare concern. Interesting. I have not experienced that. However, I definitely feel like if you're going to a dermatologist and they're offering you Botox unsolicited, that's like Mm -hmm. not a good sign for that particular dermatologist. Yeah. I mean, this isn't just like a few. This is a pretty widespread concern, I would say, across the entire medical care system where, yeah, there's a a huge conflict of interest in the fact that a lot of these aesthetic interventions – are offered by medical professionals like obviously you need medical professionals to provide them but it also strengthens this like cultural ideal we have of beauty as being intertwined with health right right beauty as being intertwined with goodness beauty as being intertwined with care and these things are all in actuality very separate now so having 
gone two weeks. So you said it was about a two week purge period Mm -hmm. where was your skin just like crazy during that time? It did get a little worse before it got better. It got very dry and tight. Um, These are all signs of the skin adjusting to its environment. Right. Um, So yeah, I, I usually recommend when people are interested in doing a complete like overhaul of their skincare regimen, taking at least 28 days um, of nothing. That is the length of the skin cycle. So that's how long it takes for a skin skin cell to be like born in the basal layer and then move up through all the layers of skin and then to become a dead skin cell and then to flake off. So if you give your skin 28 days, it is sort of a full reset of that like staggered skin cycle and you will sort of be able to tell where your skin is at um, on its own and what support Mm -hmm. it actually needs and what support it like didn't really need in the first place. And Did you find that you have, like, so for example, I have rosacea. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that if I cut out dairy, Mm -hmm. I will have less rosacea. Mm -hmm. Not making that deal. Sorry, that won't Mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay with that. But I do, like, at least in my experience, there is a huge correlation between food and skin health. Did you have to alter your diet in this process to see those results and kind of as a sub point, are there certain concessions that you make for like my skin health is just going to be not as good because I do X or Y? Yeah. Well, I mean, diet, of course, affects the skin. It affects everything. That is like pretty much the sole way that humans get the minerals and nutrients and vitamins (laughs) that keep our bodies running. So of course there is a correlation there. Um, Personally, I found it and in the research, I found that it's much more important to make sure you're giving your skin the nutrients it needs rather than eliminating particular things. Of course, um, individuals have sensitivities. If you're sensitive to dairy, that's something that you're going to have to, you know, deal with and see how it affects your body. People are sensitive to gluten and that can cause skin imbalances as well. But for the average person, it's much more important to make sure that you're getting like the building blocks of skin health than to like mm. say eliminate all sugar or eliminate all dairy. Um, so for me, like getting enough omegas was huge. Like the skin barrier is built on omega fatty acids. So like a great omega-3 supplement will do wonders for the strength and resilience of your skin barrier. That's super important. Um, Just eating a lot of like fruits and vegetables, getting your antioxidants. You know, we apply all these antioxidant anti-pollution serums, but like your skin handles antioxidants better when you're getting them through your diet and they're affecting your entire body and your skin health becomes part of that. Um, so yeah, I think it's you know much more important to add the good stuff or the essential stuff rather. I, you know, that's a habit I'm trying to break is, is using morality language and discussions of beauty, like good and bad. But to add the essential things, add what helps you function than to eliminate things that have been messaged as bad. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's, we don't have to necessarily moralize but I do think it's also there is also a push in our culture to sort of neutralize everything in a way that I also think can be unhelpful Mm. especially like so for example like I don't know if you saw this this was like probably the most cynical thing I've seen in a long time in this space was like I can't remember who did it it was some I think it was a lobby group or, or no it was a food company it was like a a very processed, you know, like a General Mills type, mm-hmm. you know, like, I mean, one of the few companies that like inarguably is like really fucking up the planet and making people unhealthy as, you know, their main profit engine, whatever, whatever. But they had put out this video. It was like, oh, like no food is good or bad. Like yeah. a donut is just as good as a carrot or whatever. And like one of the people, and it was like a doctor was in it, but it was like a doctor that works for General Mills yes. or whatever, which was like a, you know, a doctor that works for a tobacco company. Um, and I do feel like there is, and and it, you sort of see it with beauty too, right? In terms oh, of like sure. everything, it's all good. It's all empowering. Everybody's beautiful, Every, you know? Right. Like, and all I, that sort of stuff. And I do feel like where do you draw the line between like what is not... Mm unnecessarily moralizing and shaming myself and yeah. what is being unrealistic about what's actually bad for me in like a long-term sense. Yeah, that's a great question. It's definitely something that I have felt the need to tiptoe around in my work because I don't know. That's not like my particular soapbox that I want to be standing on, but of course I think about it and I yeah. do think like the pendulum swings like back and forth between extremes and like 
right now, especially with diet culture pushback, we're seeing like a huge swing swing to extremes where it's like all foods are good foods. Anything you do is good. Everything is healthy. And like that's not necessarily true either. I think a great um, like skin crossover example of that is the backlash to this idea of detoxing. Like Mm. for so long, detox has been this thing that has been like weaponized by the diet industry and also the beauty industry of something you have to do because like toxins are in your system and you have to like clean yourself out. And the backlash to that has been like detoxing doesn't exist you know, you don't need to detox at all. And like both of those are wrong. Like your body does detox. It's a natural process. You know, um, a great example of that is, you know, how your Botox wears off after three months. It's because your body has detoxed from botulinum toxin type A. (laughs) Like it's worked away that, that detox mechanism. So I do try to like address that in my work as much as is appropriate while keeping myself like on message to beauty specifically yeah. and not wading into like these waters that I like professionally don't need to be in right now because it is very polarizing. And I think there is also a big difference too between using this sort of language and using like the good bad to indicate individual responsibility or like whether an individual is good or bad and then like throwing it back at the corporations. Like no food you eat makes you a bad person, but some of these like food conglomerates do bad things, you know? Objectively. Yes. Objectively. Yes. So that I'm really interested in like that, like how do we get that message out in a way that doesn't come off as shaming people who are part of the system too and, you know, eat the foods that the bad corporation puts out, you know, because it's not necessarily an individual responsibility and it doesn't you know reflect on your individual goodness or badness but we do have to be able to say this corporation's message and products and you know whatever is objectively bad for us and for the planet well and it's also like I think this is again like to me this is very similar to the conversation that we have around fast fashion all the time Mm -hmm. on this channel because on the one hand I understand that Options can be limited. Accessibility, especially financially, is a huge issue. And you may not be in a position where you could, you know, buy secondhand clothing or, you know, uh, buy fewer items at a higher upfront cost. Like there are sometimes real limitations, and I think it's important to acknowledge those. There are also enormous amount of times where there aren't those limitations. Mm-hmm. And we are making an active choice as consumers to participate in and support systems which we know are are extremely damaging and obviously like you know in the case of you know upholding certain beauty standards it may not be as objectively a one-to-one correlation with like harming the planet or oppressing someone else but often sometimes it can be and also in the case of a lot of consumer choices it becomes very frustrating to act as though they exist in a vacuum Mm -hmm. or that they don't have broader implications. And at the end of the day, like it is all arbitrary to an extent because no one's perfect and everyone decides their own extremely arbitrary limitations. But I also think that often this push away from moralization can be a bit of a shield for participating in, you know, objectively really destructive behavior. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's something that I definitely try to address in my work. And it's probably the thing that I get the most pushback for Mm. is that I do think that we need to divest from beauty culture and from our beauty practices and from our beauty routines. Like I do think individuals have responsibility to examine their own routines and relationships to beauty and take concrete actions to extract themselves from this system that is actually extracting from them. Um, And I get that feedback a lot where it's like, but I, we live in a society, you know, yeah, we live in a society and like you're part of that society and we all have influence within our like personal spheres of influence and our behavior affects the people around us and that echoes out into the wider culture. And I do think that there is an individual responsibility there to examine ourselves and divest and stop participating as much as is safe and available to us at, at this particular point. Well, on that note, I mean, to bring it back to beauty, so I think there's been a fair amount of conversation around the male gaze as it pertains to beauty standards. And I think there is, 
and I mean, I feel somewhat I, that I identify with it, but more kind of just generally, I think there's a there's a cultural conversation around not optimizing women's uh, appearances and clothing choices and beauty choices to please, uh, you know, a heterosexual male notion of what is attractive, often sexually attractive. Um, but then you think about something like what I guess could be called the female gaze, or I know you've titled it differently, but when we look at someone like a Kardashian, for example, um, there are ways in which it is very categorically appealing to men, but then there are also ways in which that type of beauty is almost breaking a new frontier of appealing to, I would argue, almost a very specific beauty consumer, uh, more so even than a general population. Um, it seems like in your work you have, you sort of take the position I have gleaned that it's not necessarily enough to opt out of the male gaze, that the female gaze, quote unquote, can be quite destructive as well. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what you kind of think about those two um, spheres of beauty perception and then how, you know, figures like the Kardashians kind of fit into that. Yeah. Um, I think the the concept of like the male gaze is is often very misunderstood and I don't necessarily subscribe to the concept of like a female gaze because, you know, we live in a patriarchy and there's not a lot of media that is made from the strict female gaze without the influence of the internalized male gaze. And it can all get sort of like um, in the weeds there when you start diving into those terms sure. necessarily. Um, I think I think a lot of beauty culture today is this idea of like, I do it for me. And we're not necessarily taking into account all of the ways that we have internalized the standards that have been imposed on us and the way that we have been conditioned by cultural messaging around beauty so much so that it feels inherent to us. But it is not inherent to us. It is inherent to the culture. Um, so I always, you know, sort of roll my eyes at the I do it for me thing because I just don't know that any of us could truly know that for sure ever. <laughs> like it's but so again, about ingrained. anything. About anything for sure. But I mean, I talk about beauty because that's totally that's my job. But yes, of course, it applies. It applies all over the place. Um, I do sort of think that beauty standards are evolving. Um, in some ways and in some ways just becoming more like the roots of them are becoming more obvious. So like, for instance, standardized beauty, commercialized beauty, industrialized beauty. It's never actually been about beauty, mm. beauty, beauty. It's about power. It's about hierarchy. It's about wealth. It's about class. Like all of these beauty standards that we have are actually physical manifestations of systems of oppression and our attempt to signal that we are sort of in the upper echelons of society, like our aesthetic attempts to align with what is valued in society, right? And so that necessarily makes us part of like a power hierarchy. We are trying to climb the aesthetic ladder to signal all of these things. And I think what's happening in the Western beauty culture, especially right now, is that the elements of like wealth and power and class are becoming more apparent. Um, we're not categorizing this as being like attractive and adhering to the male gaze anymore. Um, you know, like you said, the Kardashians, even looking at, you know, Madonna's face from the Grammys the other night, we are valuing markers of wealth more than markers of like physical attractiveness mm. to a man mm -hmm. um and so I have been like sort of casually referring to this as the sale gaze and I think if you look at all sorts of um all sorts of different aspects of the beauty standards like you have the Kardashian thing you have Madonna you have um like there's a, an aesthetic that's been called succubus chic that's like Bella Hadid and Amelia Gray where they're you know bleaching their brows into oblivion and taking out their buckle fat and kind of creating this like almost goth look. Mm -hmm. um, even like the bimbo aesthetic that had a, a big moment, you know, a couple months ago, especially on TikTok, where it's Wasn't just like, then. <laughs> <laughs> just like this extreme, um, extreme manifestation of beauty standards and saying like, I'm using all this stuff, but I'm subverting the male gaze and I'm like leaning into this bimbo identity. If you look at all of those together, all of these like little micro trends, they're all signaling the same thing, which is an aesthetic of accumulation. Mm. It's all signaling an aesthetic of capitalism, of 
accumulating things, of consuming and making that consumption known on your face and signaling to the world, I funneled a lot of money into what I look like. Um, And I think that speaks to like a lot of the issues that we're seeing in the wider world now, like we're seeing the wealth gap um, increasing, you know, the haves have a lot and the have nots have very, very little. Um, And we're we're seeing all of these um, labor issues come up, all of these um, like class consciousness issues come up and it's playing out on our faces for sure. You know, I'm always really compelled when it comes to these shifts by data and where we can point to what's working. So like, for example, like my drum to beat is not beauty necessarily, obviously. But, mm-hmm. you know, when we when I talk about like, you know, the things that are kind of our issues, sort of like, you know, pay transparency and, you know, mm-hmm. uh the 40 work week and like all of these things that are more like labor and financially based. Typically, I I at least find it, you know, helpful, especially when, you know, making the case, especially when you think about like people going to their employers and making a case to like have some examples of like, these people are doing it well, this culture is doing it well, this company is doing it well. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there are examples for the kinds of shifts that you want to see in the beauty industry where you can point to like, this is a culture that's really kind of doing it more optimally or even, you know, specific organizations that you feel have like a really good use case for a lot of this stuff? Or do you feel like we're so lost in the sauce with beauty standards that there's like literally no culture that's doing this right? I mean, that's a great question. And and one that's kind of like blowing my mind, like I need to, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I want to have some examples to call out. Um, but no, I don't know that I can point to like a culture that's really doing it well right now. Like beauty standards, of course, have been like weaponized and accelerated by Western culture in particular, but beauty as a, a source of power and control and oppression has been a thing since the earliest civilizations and it is have has been subsumed into you know cultures across the globe so yeah I don't know I don't know that there is one culture that hasn't been um left untouched by the corruption of beauty as power to point to um but one thing I do like to point out in conversations like this is that if we look at beauty globally Mm -hmm. I like to reframe this by like who has the privilege to opt in because globally there are far more women not really participating in beauty culture in a day-to-day way than women who are Um, especially if you look to like the global south and like all of these other you know giant global cultures like it really isn't something that the majority of women can afford to opt into Mm -hmm. you know beauty requires so much time and so much money and so much headspace that like the average woman across the world does not have to invest into it um and like from our western perspective particular i think we like sort of flip that and we're like how could i possibly opt out like my survival depends on it but if you take a more global perspective i think the better question is how can i possibly opt in and there is is a lot to look I mean, there's a lot to think about when we zoom out of Western beauty culture and look at it globally and look at it as um, what it is, which is really our way of like asserting power. Yeah, I mean, it's also, I feel like playing whack-a-mole in terms of like when people point to any given culture about what they might get right on certain issues, because Mm -hmm. usually it's not always a direct correlation, but there are usually other things that are gotten hugely wrong. Um, you know, in terms of, so again, it's, it's very hard to have any of these conversations in a way that isn't stigmatizing to an individual's consumer choices. And as I was mentioning at the beginning, I think when it comes to what people struggle with, it's going to range enormously. And for some people, it may not be beauty at all. It may be, you know, maybe they don't wear a stitch of makeup, but they have an unhealthy kind of consumer relationship. Are there specific stopgap measures that you have put in place about your own consumer choices that you think could be applicable to really any kind of spending or um, feeling a need to opt into something? It's a great question. Oh, thanks. It's a really good question. And it's, I mean, it's difficult for me because I think um, like something that I have struggled with, this is a little unrelated, something I've struggled with in my work is that 
I do try to be like as journalistic and removed as possible. So like mm-hmm. I don't often reflect on like what am I doing? How could I <laughs> explain this to somebody? Because I want to remove myself from my work as much as possible and like sort of objectively talk about like the consequences of our consumer actions. Um, so I don't have anything like super prepared. I will say that if I feel the urge to consume, if I'm like scrolling through Instagram and like a targeted ad gets me or something, I do this thing, like I call it being the eternal toddler where I just keep asking myself why I want a particular thing. Why is the person who's selling it appealing to me? And when I dig deeper into that, there's always something that like doesn't feel good at Mm. the base of it you know it's like okay this influencer is selling me on this like microbiome friendly cleanser or something okay why does that sound appealing to me uh okay because I know the microbiome is super important okay but why does that have to like correlate to a product oh it doesn't okay so why was this appealing to you I guess because I think the influencer is beautiful and I should be that beautiful why okay because she's like blonde and skinny and I, I wish I was blonde and skinny and like when you get to the core of it this is not something that aligns with my values like my want is not something that feels inherent to me I'm more able to see that it is inherent to the culture and therefore not something that I want to act on. Mm. If that makes sense? No, it totally does. I think, I mean, sometimes I think it probably can't be, unfortunately, I think there are many purchases that are just like, because I want it, you know? And yeah. there's such a strong For sure. Such well, a strong there's a great quote that I always come back to, and this is a good trick um, whenever I want to purchase something. Have you ever read any um, Tressie McMillan Cotton? Mm-hmm. She Okay, love her. I love the book Thick. Um, She has a great quote in Thick that is, I like what I like is always a capitalist lie. And I think that's, for the most part, pretty true and has helped me deconstruct a lot of my own internal um, struggles over why I like the things I like and Mm. what has influenced me and whether or not um, that want or that like is something that I want to, you know communicate yeah. to the world through my aesthetic choices no I think that's probably true I think I don't know listen anyone who's listened to this show for five seconds knows that we blame we blame quite a lot on capitalism here <laughs> um, and we're quite quite critical but I do think a lot of it is I do think there is some of it that is I don't want to go like evolutionary biologist here but I do think there's like there's an element of peacocking and of assertion of value and all of these things that probably always have existed even outside of oh, industrialized sure. capitalism and probably always will. I do yeah. think I would maybe even just extend that to say that I like what I like is like never uncompromised, whether by, you know, capitalism yeah, or that's otherwise. That's a good point too. And that's also something I think about too is like, what am I trying to express with this consumer choice? And is there a non-consumerist way to express said thing? So like beauty as self-expression is a big thing. So I will try to think of what are other forms of self-expression? Because aesthetic self-expression is not the end all be all. And it's not even the most like powerful or fulfilling one. Like there's music, there's dance, there's like, you know, writing a letter to a friend, like going out to eat with your family, like expressing yourself, talking. Like totally. there are tons of non-consumerist forms of self-expression. So if like that's what you're after with a beauty purchase you're making, think of like what's what's a way that I could do this without a product involvement? Ritual is a big one. Like people love to say like my skincare routine is my ritual. I need it. Ritual has been around since the beginning of time. Products haven't. You don't need a product to do a ritual. You can do a facial massage with your fingers and water for 10 minutes. And that is like way more fulfilling and um, good for your skin than a 10-step skincare routine. Man, I have to say, I have, I'm quite, I don't know if I'm going to do the two-week cleanse. We got to, <laughs> we got, are you allowed to wear makeup during that time if you take it off with the hobo I mean, you're oil? allowed to do literally whatever you no, want, No, I know, girl. but like, will, will results <laughs> really vary that much? I would do nothing. Okay. I would do nothing, nothing, but. All right, well, we'll see. Um, But suffice to say, I am, I am motivated to, to try something adjacent to it because I do feel that it is very interesting to here as someone who has had extensive skincare issues I've said this a million times but we're so often getting advice from people who are just genetically blessed and whatever it is that they happen to be talking about mm-hmm. like I'm 
done with listening to skincare <laughs> advice from people who have genetically great skin, which is the majority of them. But, um, but also the act of influencing, quote unquote, which is what you're doing, um, decoupled from buying anything or being additive, like yeah. uh, influencing in a way that's kind of fundamentally subtractive. Um, I think is interesting and really kind of like it's it's something I think more of us should should try. I like that framework. I might use it. Yeah. The subtractive method. Well, I think it's I think it's really interesting. And I also do think I mean, I've I, I, you know, we talk a lot a lot of our audience is like they're, you know, they're on the spectrum, but I would say in general most of the people who listen to and watch this show are on the more subtractive side than anything else to begin with, but I do think that even amongst people who are subtractive, um, who are more minimalist in their approach to a lot of these things, the framework of the media that they consume and the people they listen to are still people who are sort of teaching you how to optimize less, if that makes sense, yes. and creating products and routines and spaces mm-hmm. for for doing so. So it's no, nice it's to just be sense. like, do nothing. Yeah, just try it. You can always do something later if the nothing doesn't work out. That's true. I don't, I don't know, guys. We might have to do a little a little BNA moment. We'll see how this goes. Um, anyway, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, I really love having um, people with all different types of perspectives, especially um, who are different from you know myself, and then also the people that we've had on this channel. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this really unique perspective. Thank that I think you so is much for having me. Very refreshing. <laughs> quite a quite a healthy antidote. Um, so for people who want to kind of learn more about what you do, where could they go? Most of my work is now um, via my newsletter. The newsletter is called The Unpublishable. It's on Substack, and it's jessicadefino.substack.com. It's really genuinely quite good. I highly recommend it. Um, I was just reading it this morning on the Amtrak. (laughs) All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you next week on an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. Bye, everyone. (laughs) 